Well, last week, we learned about Cain. Remember that? Your memories go back a week? What do we know about Cain? He's a bad guy. First murder. Today, we're going to look at two of his siblings. So I titled this, Who is Abel and Who is Seth? What was the relationship to God and Jesus Christ? I was raised in church. Dropped out a while when I was in my late teens and 20s and stuff, but I pretty much went to church most of my life on and off. I've heard many sermons. Heard many great sermons. Heard many pulpit slamming sermons. Bible slamming, hallelujah, praise God sermons. And I've heard quiet little sermons. But I was looking at Seth. I've heard many sermons on Cain and Abel. I knew I did not want to be like Cain, but I needed to be like Abel. But I had never heard much about Seth. So I started looking at who Seth was. I kind of knew the general thing, but who was Seth really? I don't know that I've ever heard a message preached on Seth. I may have, but if I did, it did not resonate with me. It did not record where I can recall anything about it. By the end of this message today, I hope you can never say that. I hope you'll know who Abel and Seth are. Well, Abel was the second son listed in the Bible of Adam and Eve. Genesis 4.2. Abel was a righteous man who pleased God. Abel was a shepherd, known for bringing God a pleasing sacrifice from the firstborn of his flock. Cain, Abel's older brother, did not bring God a pleasing sacrifice. Cain was angry at God's displeasure, and he murdered Abel for it. Genesis 4.10. That, in a nutshell are the physical facts of what we know about Abel. That's all I can tell you from the Bible about the physical things of Abel. He pleased God. He gave a good sacrifice. He was a shepherd. And he was the second son born to Adam and Eve. We don't know about his children. If he had children, a wife, we don't know anything about him. But amazingly enough, we can learn quite a bit from the way he lived and died. Abel demonstrated true worship by faith and through his actions. Jesus even identified Abel as the world's first martyr, Matthew 23, 35. Hebrews 11 is a chapter on faith. And in the fourth verse, it commends Abel for his faith. So Hebrews 11, verse 4. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, though which he obtained witness that he was righteous, righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, being dead, still speaks. Wow, that's the New King James Version. And through it still speaks. So how does Abel still speak to us June 13th, 2021, many thousands of years after he was slain? How's he still speaking? The Bible tells me he's still speaking. I literally believe every word that God has in the Bible. So that means that Abel is still speaking today. He speaks in that he demonstrated true worship of God. And his actions remain an example of faith and righteousness for us today and for eternity. Christ said he was the first martyr, he was the first one to die. We know that we cannot please God if we don't please God through faith, Hebrews 11:6. We are called to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, John 4, 24. Here's something many Christians seem to forget. We seem to forget what we were told about what our life is like by following Jesus Christ. Abel was persecuted for his faith. We will be as well. We read in John 15, 20. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. 
if they kept my word, they will keep yours. And in 2 Timothy 3.12, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Jesus Christ will suffer persecution. We're told over and over again in the Bible that we will be persecuted. But yet when some adversity happens, many times our first thing is to throw up our hands and say, Why me, God? Why me? Uh, sorry, Bob. I told you it was going to happen. I told you. It ain't about me. It's about following Christ. It's about faith. It's about understanding. Now, Abel's blood, God heard Abel's blood cry out from the ground. And he responded. God responded to the call from Abel's blood. Well, God hears our cries today. He hears our pleas. He hears our requests for Judy. He hears our requests for healing for the ones we love. When we pray for people, he hears that. God hears our calls. He hears our cries. He always responds to them. God does not non-respond. Now, he doesn't always respond the way we want. I'm almost sure Abel would have preferred not to have been slain. I'm just guessing on that, but I'm almost sure. But God responded to him in the way that God thought was proper. In Abel's story, we find that God's plan is not impeded by what other people decide to do. Satan cannot impede the plan of God. He cannot impede our lives if we live them in faith on God's word through Jesus Christ. He can't impede us. Abel's blood's also mentioned again. Hebrews 12, 24. To Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of the sprinkling that speaks better than all, uh, better than things than that of Abel. So, speaking about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ being much better than the sacrifice of Abel. So Abel's mentioned quite a bit in the Bible to only know a couple of facts about him, that he's the second born, that he was a shepherd, that he, gave a, he loved God and he gave an offering and he was slain. That's the facts we know. But there's a lot more about him that we find in the scriptures. When they compare the blood of Abel to Jesus, they're comparing one righteous man, who's righteous because he loved God and he was made righteous through God, to another righteous man, who's righteous from the very beginning because he was God, Jesus Christ. They were both murdered by people with evil intent. But Jesus' blood speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. How's that? Abel's blood cried out for vengeance against murder. His blood called out to God for vengeance against his brother Cain. That's what Abel's blood called for. Jesus' blood calls out for forgiveness for the murderers. Luke 23, 34. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. Jesus cried out for to forgive the ones that were absolutely murdering him. They had refused to humble themselves. They did not ask for forgiveness. They did not change from their evil ways. But he chose to forgive them for this deed even as they divided his garments, even as they watched him take his last breath, even as they watched the Son of God die on the old wooden cross. That's what Jesus' blood did. It's a blood of forgiveness. Abel, as righteous as he was, was a blood of vengeance. Abel was righteous. His death only demonstrates the sinfulness of humanity. Even humanity when there's only a few people alive. And it shows us what happens after the fall from grace. Adam and Eve had sinned. They broke their covenant with God. They were sent out of Eden. They bore children. Cain was the first human being born of two other human beings. Adam was created from the dust. Eve was created from Adam. Cain was created from the joining together sexually of Adam and Eve. 
He was born like everyone has been born since, except for Jesus. Jesus was the only exception to this, and he had the conception from God. But everybody else that's been born has went through this process. Abel was murdered, Cain punished, Abel's blood cried out for God to make it right. Jesus was righteous, completely righteous. But his murder led to the possibility of life for all of mankind. That's what the blood of Jesus Christ did, made a way for all of mankind. No vengeance. Jesus' death really highlighted man's sinfulness. Sometimes we like to take and believe that if Jesus would have come today, we'd have treated him a whole lot different. We'd have treated him with respect and honor and love. I've got to tell you, those of us speaking and those of us hearing would have been among those going, crucify him! Oh, we don't like to think of that. We don't. But that's our human nature. That's our sin nature. If Christ would have chose this time to come into humanity, he would have been treated the same. The blood of Jesus Christ is critical to our salvation. The blood of Jesus Christ had to be shed for our salvation. His blood speaks a good word, one of atonement, one of help. A blood sacrifice, such as Abel's in Genesis uh, 4, with his offering of the firstborn, has always been necessary for the atonement of sin. Sin has never been forgiven, atoned for, without a blood sacrifice. Hebrews 9.22 And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. So you have to have blood. Well, think of this. Was Cain and Abel, did they make the first, or did uh, Abel make the first blood sacrifice to God? The answer is no. There was a blood sacrifice made before Abel. Oh, well, wait a second. Or, yeah, wait a second. Abel was the second one born. He was the shepherd. The other had fruit and veggies. Come on, Bob. This is the first blood sacrifice. But the Bible gives us another blood sacrifice. In the fall of Adam and Eve, in Genesis 3, God made clothing for Adam and Eve from the skins of animals. Now, I don't know about you, but every time I've skinned an animal, they've died. I don't see a lot of skinless animals running around. So the first actual blood that was given was done by God to provide clothes to cover the nakedness of Adam and Eve. And how did they know they were naked? Because they sinned and ate from the forbidden tree. So God started the method for forgiveness of sins by his own hands. Later on, the Mosaic Law formalized this sacrificial system. And this is how God chose for people to come to him through the sacrifice. The book of Hebrew goes into great detail about Jesus' sacrifice being better than the Old Testament sacrificial system. When Jesus came, he did away with that sacrificing of the animals, that sacrificing of the blood by his blood, because it was a better word. It supplanted, surpassed, replaced all the old. Jesus offered his sacrifice once and for all. The previous ones were temporary. They had certain schedules, certain festivals. They had certain times. They had things they had to do to make their sacrifices. Jesus made the sacrifice once and for all for eternity. Jesus' blood is a permanent atonement. It's not a temporary atonement. Those that say that you can be saved by the blood of cross, then lost again, are not looking at the permanent atonement of the blood of Christ. You are saved by the blood of Christ. You are saved for eternity by the blood of Christ. You are not saved temporarily. You don't have to go back and get another dose of Christ's blood ever so often. You, Christ doesn't have to shed his blood over and over again. 
We are saved by the blood of Christ once and for all. Cain was banished. But Adam and Eve were given Seth. Seth is who the Messiah ultimately came from, came through. When Adam and Eve had another son, they named him Seth. The Hebrew word for Seth was appointed because Eve had said that God appointed her another offspring to replace Abel, Genesis 4.25. Seth's offerings were considered to be righteous. His lineage was considered to be righteous. It was through Seth's line that Enoch and Noah came. All the other lineages died out with the flood. It was only through Noah that we continued. Noah came down through Seth. Now, Adam and Eve had many more children after Seth. But we're not coming through their lineage. We're coming through the lineage of Seth. I told Jackie, when I got into studying this, I never realized the direct importance that Seth has for us. As important as Noah, David, or any other person that we think of as being responsible in the lineage of Christ. Genesis 4.26 said that Seth had a son, Enosh, and it was during those days that people began to call on the name of the Lord. That people began to call on the name. So underneath Enosh, people began to call on the name of the Lord. Formalized worship began. It went from being the individual with God to basically corporate worship, group worship. It began during this time. But the word call has a special meaning. Before I could be a pastor, I had to go through several, several times of explaining my call to preach to different people that could approve it or deny it. I had to get approval from boards. I had to get approval from pastors. I had to get approval from, from the, the district. I had to get approval because of my call. I had to be able to tell what my call was. I couldn't walk in and say, you know, I think it'd be fun if I start preaching. How about give me a church and I'm going to go out there and try that. You have to be called. You know another name for the word call? It's to proclaim. To proclaim. It refers to testifying about God to one another. To be called is to testify. To testify about God to one another. That's simply what a pastor does. If you're called to preach the good news, you're testifying about God. It's nothing about you. It's all about God. It's through Seth's family that all this began in a fallen world. Abel had worshipped God. Now Seth's family did the same. Even when God pronounced a curse upon sin... A curse upon the ground, a curse upon what would be labor, and a curse for women to bear children. He also promised a savior, Genesis 3.15. He also, at the same time he cursed sin, he provided a savior, a way out. We have known about the blood of Christ since the very beginning. People have been saved by the blood of Christ before Christ ever came. He was the promised Messiah. Abel was a victim of sinfulness. The promised Savior came and his blood speaks a better word. Now it goes on to say when Seth was 105 years old, his son Enosh was born. Let that register for a second. He's 105 and he has a baby. Hmm. Wow. Just a little rabbit trail off of that. It's not even part of the message. But you know during the millennia, people will live, and if you die before 120, you'll be accursed. People, you know, we're going to live long lives. People are having babies at 105 will not be unusual again. Just think. If you just could be in the millennial, you could have babies at 200 years old. What joy. Okay, back to my message. <laughs> Enosh was born, and Enosh continues 
this godly line that Seth that leads us to Abraham. So here we go from Seth, Enosh. Now we get down to Abraham. The story of Cain's killing of the righteous seed Abel and God's raising up another seed becomes a central part of the divine plan. Evil, Satan, is always trying to get rid of the word of God. He's always trying to get rid of good. Always trying to stop God's plans. Here's some good news. There will always be a Seth to replace an Abel. If a righteous one is killed or taken out of the way, there will be a righteous one to replace him. God's plan will go forward. It does not depend on me, you, or any other person. God has a plan. That makes me feel so good. How would you like to think that everything on God's plan depending on you? Is there anyone that could bear up to that pressure? Good thing is you don't have to. It was through the seed of Seth that Jesus was born. Genesis 5, 3 and 8, 1 Chronicles 1, 1 and Luke 3, 38. Unlike Cain's descendants, Seth's proved faithful to God. Notice there's no mention of Abel's. We don't know if Abel had children. We have no idea. But they're not mentioned. So from Seth came the patriarchs, the nation of Israel, eventually Christ. It's Christ who not only destroys Satan, but condemns sin and death. Luke 3, 23, uh, Luke 3, 23 through 38. It was through Seth that the offspring, the seed of the woman, Jesus Christ, would come and crush the serpent's head, Genesis 3, 15. We're told about that right there at the beginning, through her seed, through Seth. Then as the generations come down, it comes from the seed of another woman, Mary, who God used to bring Jesus Christ. This has been a patriarchal world for the most part. Men still seem to have a lot of prominent positions in the world. But almost everything that's good has happened has happened through woman, except for that first little incident with Eve. But almost everything else has been really good that God has done through women. But how did God use these three brothers? These were the firstborn of a fallen world. These were the first three we know about. God used them to set the path for our redemption from sin. God used these three brothers. He used Cain. He used Abel. He used Seth. Cain was banished. Cain's seed did not continue on past Noah. We believe Cain and all the other lines died out with Noah. We know Noah's family was the one that come through the flood. We know that Adam, or um, Abel, he died. We have no idea. And children, I, if it was important, it would have been told to us. But we know Seth. We know everything about his lineage. It can be directly connected. Step after step after birth 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 after down to Jesus Christ. We know from where that lineage comes. But God used these three to set the path for the redemption from sin, from the redemption from hell, by the only begotten Son of His, Jesus Christ. God used the death, the pain, the misery, the hurt that happened to bring about good. God will do the same today. He will use the hurt, the pain, the misery of our lives, the things that happen to us, even when we're persecuted, even when we see things happening that we say we don't, want them to happen. When we're sick, God will use all of this. He will use Judy's illnesses. He uses death. He will use Matthew's coma. He will use all the things that happen to us
for a reason, for a purpose, and the purpose will be good. Now on that, I stand on faith. That, I stand on the word of God. Because that's what God's word tells me. This book right here, I need no other book. I need no other theology. I need no other message. But the message of Jesus Christ, who born, raised, suffered, died, rose again for my sins, for my eternal salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for Seth. We thank you for the story on Abel. We thank you for Noah, Abraham. We thank you for King David. We thank you for all that have come down before us. Each one of us go back, Father. Our lineage goes back to Seth. It does not go back to Cain. It does not go back to Abel. It does not go back to the other children of Adam and Eve. Our lineage goes back to Seth. The same lineage that brought Jesus Christ, our brother. He was the firstborn of many. I thank you for Jesus Christ. I thank you for the sacrifice for his blood. Father, I worship you. I adore you. I love you. I ask, Father, that you will let me express this through my life so that others may come to know and love and adore you. I pray for the lost. I pray for anyone that's hearing this word today, if they are lost, to seek Jesus Christ, to seek our Savior, to seek salvation while it can be found. Again, Father, the prayers that we've lifted up today, I lift them up again and again. I ask, Father, that you'll let us leave this place knowing that we've been in your presence, Father, been in the presence of the Lord. That I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.